If you sat on the back row this coming Sunday, what do you think you would see? Hello, Malcolm here. Welcome to Tuesday Teaching Tips. This is episode 374, and we're starting a new series called Hosting Sunday Worship. Today, part one on hosting and the New Testament perspective on worship. Now, back to that scenario. You're sitting at the back this coming Sunday. What do you see? Well, a few years ago, I left my usual seat on the front row and went to sit at or near the back for about three months. And what a revelation it was. I learned so much. Now, I saw many good things. I saw people taking notes on the sermon, all kinds of things. But I was, I was shocked to see church members with their phones out on Facebook during the service. I saw one person actually reading a novel during the sermon. Some other people just chatting to one another during the singing, during the sermon, during announcements, all kinds of parts of the service. I asked them over time why, trying not to pass judgment, because I don't know what's going on. And it turns out that some people simply couldn't see what was happening. Some people couldn't hear what was going on. Others self-confessed that they were not in a good place spiritually. And quite a few told me, they were bored. How tragic. A bored at a time of coming together for worship. Now the reasons for the behavior I saw at the back, they were multifactorial. But one thing was clear. The people up front were not engaging the people at the back. And that's what I want to talk about today and throughout this whole series. Creating full engagement for everybody in our times of collective worship. You see, sometimes we've got to rethink why we do what we do on a Sunday. I mean, what is the point of welcoming people, of public prayer, of the Lord's Supper, of preaching, and the other things that we do when we are gathered? And it's all too easy, isn't it, to do the same old, same old, because that's the way it's always been done. We, are, we like things to be as they are. We tend to prefer comfort. So today, though, we're going to think about this. Today, we're going to begin the multi-part series exploring the reasons why we do what we do at a Sunday gathering. And additionally, we will discuss how those who lead us in different parts of our worship together can be most useful in what they do and how they do it. So I'm going to be talking about guidelines, and they are, by the way, guidelines, not rules, but they involve anybody involved in our collective times of worship on a Sunday. So that means anybody who's leading a prayer, welcoming people, making an announcement, doing a reading, sharing something like a testimony, perhaps leading us in sung musical worship, uh, preaching and teaching. And by extension, I think it also applies in some, on some level to people involved with ushering, serving refreshments, and indeed in anything that's kind of visible on a Sunday morning or whenever you meet for church. And by the way, this series comes out of a set of articles I've been writing for the Watford Church of Christ uh, this year, 2024. And so what I'm sharing is located in the context of my local congregation. Not everything I share here might be applicable to you, depending on your location, your culture, your situation. But I hope and pray that there will be enough here in terms of principles that can be a blessing to you as much as Watford or anywhere else in this universe. So let's talk about a few things today on an introductory level, and next week we'll get into some more specifics. Firstly, the idea of leading worship as hosting. I wonder if you've ever thought about this. Perhaps you've never considered it this way, but I believe that hosting is a meaningful way, a really meaningful way to think about leading a congregation, whether it's in singing, praying, or speaking, or any other context. And by the way, in the show notes, I put in a couple of footnotes to articles I've written more about this idea. I wish I had more time today, but we'll just touch on it uh, briefly. Hosting as a model for leading worship. In his book, Liturgical Theology, Simon Chan says this. The first thing to remember is that worshippers are not in church primarily to welcome one another. They are gathered to meet God. In a sense, God is the host, and we are being welcomed into his presence. I think that's critical. God is the host. We're coming into his presence collectively. 
agree with Chan in principle and suggest that although God is the ultimate host, he delegates that hosting to those of us leading when we gather for worship. There's a delegation going on. Somebody human is present to acknowledge our divine host and to sort of help his hosting be effective for us in this particular place at this particular time. So I see those leading worship, whatever they're doing, as sort of sub-hosts, helping us to be aware of the over-host in our midst, which is God himself. Now, because a good host, if you've been to any good parties or good occasions hosted by somebody, a good host wants everybody at their event to enjoy themselves, to have to, to participate in something meaningful. And that's true that God wants that for us when we gather. But that means those of us leading in worship have to be thinking that way. How can I help everybody here experience something meaningful? Those on the front row, the middle row, and the back row. Or if you're sitting in a circle, those right next to me in the circle, those on the far side of the circle, those who are younger, those who are older, those who are here for the very first time, and those who've been here for the thousandth time. Everybody needs to know they matter because a good host values every single person they've invited. And God has invited all of the people there that Sunday, and it's important that they know that they matter. So a question for reflection perhaps here, or uh, some further discussion if you want to do this with some friends. If God is our ultimate host, and those leading worship are the local hosts, what does this mean when we lead a prayer, for example? What are we hoping to achieve? And likewise, the same thing for people leading us in musical worship or learning from God's word. What is our purpose? What are, what are we hoping to achieve? So that's the concept of hosting. More on that in the links that I've given in the show notes. Now let's think for a little bit about the New Testament examples and teaching on collective worship. Now I've taught elsewhere many other recordings on this, so you can search my YouTube channel for that. So I'm not going to go into the detail today. It's sort of more of an overview to help us to think in general about this, about New Testament examples and New Testament teaching on collective worship. What do we actually know about how the early church worshipped when they gathered? Uh, the New Testament instructions about collective worship Sunday worship, it, it's sparse, and New Testament examples of Sunday worship are, uh, are limited when you look into the scriptures. I think we can be confident of some things. We can be confident that when they gathered, what they did included some sense of corporately expressed worship in prayer and singing, collective expressions of worship. We can be pretty sure that it involved fellowship. We can be certain, I think, that they were learning together, uh, the preaching and teaching and reading of Scripture. And it's pretty clear that they took the Lord's Supper regularly. I've put some references in the show notes here to Acts 2, Acts 20, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, and 1 Timothy 4. Have a look at those. In fact, my suggestion would be that you read those Scriptures that are in the show notes and any others you can find that mention collective worship. Write down what you notice about the services of the New Testament church. What do you see there? What were they doing and why do you think they were doing it? Is it possible to figure out their thinking around those issues? And when you've done that, does anything stand out that causes you to rethink what you do in your local church? Now let's talk about the aims of collective worship. We looked at hosting, we've looked at the New Testament, Aims of collective worship. Now, the aim of gathering together is very hard to express in a short recording like this. However, however, perhaps we can summarize much of what we hope will happen in these quotes from Ron Highfield's very thought-provoking little book called Rethinking Church. And I've recorded elsewhere about that somewhere, so look on my YouTube channel for that. But what about that book? Here's a couple of quotes. He says, firstly, this. What do you think? Worship is a God-directed activity that attempts in thought, word, bodily position and movement or symbolic use of elements of creation to express a fitting response to the being, character and action of God. A lot of words in there, but that's a really neatly, powerfully sort of distilled 
definition of worshipping together. God directed in thought, word, bodily position, movement, symbolic elements of creation to express a fitting response to the being, character and action of God, of course, who is with us as host. Second quote from the book. We express, when we come together, what he's saying is we express awe at God's greatness, gratitude for his generosity, praise for his excellence, longing for his presence, and amazement at his love. That's what our prayer, our singing, our fellowship is all about, isn't it? Expressing awe at God's greatness, gratitude for his generosity, praise for his excellence, longing for his presence, amazement at his love. In other words, we gather because of God to connect with God and honor God by what we say and do when we worship together. His love draws us together, inspires us to express ourselves in worship of him and creates an eagerness to learn of him, learn from him and about him. And then he, the Spirit, sends us back out into the world to live Jesus' life and tell people about him. I'd say those are the aims of our collective times of worship. What do you think? What do you think are the aims? So let me wrap up. God is our ultimate host. But when we lead in a worship setting, we are representing our heavenly host father. And so how does this affect the way that you speak and act when you stand up in front of the congregation? The New Testament is short on worship service details, but it's long on who we worship. So what do you sense are the chief aims of collective worship and how can you advance those aims when you lead people in worship? Now, let me conclude with a challenge. I'll give you a challenge each week and here's the challenge for this week. What will you do differently the next time you lead in some form on a Sunday that will engage the back row? Think about the back row or think about the far side of the circle, the people furthest from you. What will you do this next time that you next time you stand up to do anything, to teach, to preach, to lead a song, to lead a prayer, to welcome everybody, whatever it is, what will you do differently to engage that back row? I'd love to know what you think, actually. And if you do that, please take the challenge. And when you do, drop a comment in the comments here and let everybody know what was effective. Or perhaps if it's not effective, what you did that wasn't so effective so we can learn from that we learn from our successes and we learn from our failures too don't we next week we will examine general principle guidance for people leading worship including context attitude connection themes overloading and preparation love to know what you think about this so please add your comments on this week's topic uh, let's leave those comments where we can see them because then we can learn from each other and we learn best when we're learning in community. If you have any questions about the Bible, drop me an email. That The email address is on the screen there. If you'd like a free copy of my book on spiritual disciplines, How God Grows His People, then sign up for my newsletter at the website. Please pass this link on, subscribe, leave a review. And until the next time, I hope you have a wonderful day. Remember to keep calm and carry on teaching. Take care and God bless.